What I thought I would do is actually summarise for you uh, some of the data we've just, this in the last uh, few months, been putting together a paper that we've submitted for publication. And in doing that, it's been really a tremendous amount of work, but also very enlightening. So into that, this presentation in the next sort of 10 or 15 minutes, give you a summary of the last eight years effort that you guys have been putting into hand hygiene and see what it looks like nationally to talk briefly about four emerging issues which are going to then be expanded upon by other speakers today and then four uh, future initiatives. So all of you know about the five moments obviously and hand hygiene and here's the summary from June this year. We had 937 organisations involved, about two thirds public, one third private, pardon me, uh, that the aggregate hand, national hand hygiene compliance rate was just on 84%. Medical practitioners, which I'll come back to, is just under 72%. And that most hospitals, because we're now getting a lot of non-hospitals wanting to submit data, were above, similar to or above the 80% mark, about 94%. And we'll come to the benchmark issues in a second. This is a steady increase in the number of uh, institutions that are participating in the program, the darker blue being public hospitals and the others being privates. And it's about 97 to 99 per cent of the acute public hospital beds. It's not 100 per cent because there are a couple of states that don't require hospitals with less than 20 beds to always submit data, but they do submit at least once a year. So essentially we've got 100 per cent of the acute care beds in Australia submitting at least once a year, but not every single time, and a majority of the private hospital beds. And here's a terrific graph from Andrew Stewardson where the, every dot is a, an Australian hospital and this is uh, in June 2009 and if your 95% confidence intervals were below, in this case 70%, you're a red dot. If they straddled 70%, you're 95%, then you're a yellow dot. And if your lower 95% um, um, confidence interval was above 70%, you're a green dot. And so you can see that there's been a steady improvement with more and more green until the middle of this year. Okay? For a price, I can tell you who these two red dots are. Um, and they know who they are. But you know, as any, any CEO would say, well, it is unacceptable. The size of the dot is the size of the hospital. So these are two big hospitals. You know, which hospitals are they? And they are clearly underperforming. And if I were the CEO there, I would be asking why. They are asking why. Now, as many of you be aware, uh, ARMAC decided that the benchmark should be raised to 80%. Some of us had views about that. We've discussed this at other workshops. Personally, I would rather we said that all healthcare worker groups 24-7, including on weekends, had to hit 70 or 75, and then mathematically we'd be well above 80 anyway. But anyway, it was a political decision and it went to 80. And this is what it looks like, the same graph when you move it to 80. So there's a lot more red and there's certainly those two red dots are still here, but um, there's a lot of other red dots there also in the last audit period. So some of, some of us are you know, suffering some indigestion from this, but nevertheless, there's, the program's been going long enough and the view was that 80% should be the target, uh, be the benchmark. Now there's been a steady improvement across all states and territories, so here they are, and you can see that really very believable improvements in every state and territory across the country, including the private sector. And what's interesting is that um, we've actually almost been a victim of our own success, so that more and more non-hospital institutions have wanted to join Hand Hygiene Australia. You know, places where we don't think of much disease trans... I mean, you do hand hygiene to reduce disease transmission, right? So, you know, dental facilities all wanting to join the program, you sort of think, well, it's one dentist and, you know, maybe only, you know, eight or ten patients in a whole day. Well, it's led to uh, Sally and others developing a whole new tool for dentists and so we've been involved in that and then, of course, community health centres. I haven't put in here the psychiatric facilities. Well, you know, not a lot of disease transmission in psychiatry, but still they want to join, so who are we to say no? So you can see now that actually hospitals constitute only 94% of all the the participating sites, but they contribute 98.1% of, um, of the available data. I'm using my pointer and you can't see it. So, um, it's not showing up right. so um, the, the point is that the majority of the data is still coming from hospitals. Now here actually, over the, since 2009, all the moments <coughs> that are being submitted, blue being uh, 
uh, correct moments and red being un incorrect moments. And currently every audit period about half a million moments are submitted into the hand hygiene database. So there's 10.1 million moments in the hand hygiene database. This is by far the largest data, you know, data set in the world. This is breaking it into uh, the different hospitals, acute care hospitals, day hospitals, and other hospitals. And you can still see that, you know, that some of the bigger acute care hospitals are struggling. This is uh, with the, at an 80% benchmark. But so often we say, hear people say, well, you know, we're, hospital, we're special, you know, we're a cancer institute and we've got really complex patients. And so and you sort of think, well, is that an excuse to have worse hand hygiene? I would have thought the average person actually thinks you should be better because you're so special. Um, but, you know, so we, it, it's interesting how humans can provide an excuse. I mean, it's like listening to teenagers, you know, why their iPhone battery went flat or something. You know, there's always an excuse and it's always dad's fault, you know, so... Um, it's Dad's fault that I left my phone at home. Um, so, so here's just the typical thing that we've often seen with moments one and two being lower than the after moments of three and four, and it's been a focus of uh, some educational programs. But this is really notable. So this is a summary of moments one, two, three, four, five, with the red line being all moments combined since 2009, right up to the middle of this year. And so you can see that there's been a steady improvement in all the moments actually. What's really interesting is the orange line because that's moment two and a couple of states have had particular educational programs about moment two you know before a procedure and you can see that it's actually worked <coughs> um, you know it worked very nicely so it's not now up around the same rate as moment four. So this shows these things work. Here we've got the latest audit and you can again see the docs uh, are one of the lower groups Maybe I haven't put radiology technicians here because have any of you ever seen a radiology technician alcohol rub their hands when they put a chest x-ray plate behind a person's back? Never. Um, so, but they're a small group. But this again is a summary since 2009 right through 2017 where doctors are in red, nurses are in the light blue and, and allied health in green. And so you can see actually it's been a very steady, when we say that you know, doctors are hopeless, well, they're just sort of retarded. Um, <laughs> because you can see that doctors are now, after all these years, about where the nurses started at, right? Um, but it's not like they can't learn, it's just that they're slower. So we need to be sympathetic and um, accept that they're doing well, and, uh, but that the, everyone is improving at about. So this is, you know, for the, to my knowledge, the first time anywhere in the world where a whole country who's been able to present data like this. Uh, it's important. And this is just a, a further example of the number of hits on uh, credentialing programs um, during the same period. Of course, we know that there have been other uses. There's been essential uh, hand hygiene database and direct entry. We'll come back to this in a second. Has huge benefits, as I'm going to go into, in terms of reducing time for data entry. Uh, it's cheap and flexible and it's been used in New Zealand about to be used hopefully in Israel and Hong Kong and uh, you know, other countries aligned with WHO. So uh, what's the outcome measure? Well, we haven't, as part of the original proposal for Hand Hygiene Australia, we wanted to measure monthly staph bacteremia rates, but it was decided that that was, was enough to do without doing that, and so we haven't done it. But Brett Mitchell and Peter Collignon and uh, Rebecca McCann have done this nice study where they've shown a reduction in hospital onset staph aureus bacteremias. And you'll see the, the years at the bottom there, although you know, we can't say that all the benefits are entirely due to hand hygiene, it is very, very closely aligned with the rollout of the program. And uh, I think it's, you know, if, it, if, if nothing else, hand hygiene has raised awareness about IPC across the board. So in summary, the um, Hand Hygiene Australia is the largest and most successful worldwide, uh, with more than 10.1 million moments recorded so far, and the compliance rates we just talked about. So what are some of the other initiatives? Well, we've got this large central database, we've got this new direct entry app, or well, not so new anymore, and we started to use the same platform, the same operating system, to actually link in with the agar group, the antimicrobial group on uh, um, Australian group on antimicrobial resistance, so that we've actually adapted the system so that it can download the um, MIC data from Vitec and the laboratory systems to get resistance rates and then fill in clinical report forms like this to align that with the lab data. 
So this has now been adopted. So it's like we have one operating system and two databases, uh, one for hand hygiene and one for antimicrobial resistance, and they're a key contributor to the Aura program currently. What about the cost of Hand Hygiene Australia? Well, we looked at this just uh, recently in the last financial year. Uh, important because the National Hand Hygiene Initiative is now in maintenance or embedment phase. And so we thought, well, we'll compare it to the number of hospitalisations and the number of patient bed days. And that was this 15, 16 is the last year that we've got these data. So if you look at the annual budget just for Hand Hygiene Australia, now of course all your hospitals are bearing the cost of alcohol rub in your time, but if you just look at the central budget of 643000 the cost of running Hand Hygiene Australia is 2.2 cents per inpatient day for Australia and 6.1 cents per hospital admission. So by my standards, this is pretty cheap. So it's smaller, well, 2.2 cents is smaller, smaller than the smallest coin that you can get in the Australian currency. So what about four, in the last couple of minutes, four key emerging issues? And for those of you at New South Wales Summit, you will have heard some of this before. The first is that you really shouldn't be thinking about auditing in it on its own anymore. It's education and auditing. So you don't just stand there and what, audit and audit and watch a whole lot of bad practice. After you've seen it, a little bit of it happening, you say, stop, stop, I can't stand it, and go and educate people. Okay? So this is important because it provides timely feedback. It means the education is obviously context specific and it allows this sort of dual education audit role to help local embedment. Okay, it's very much uh, what New South Wales were doing certainly before Victoria and, uh, and I think it's, it's what we should all be doing across the country. Queensland were also doing it, other states too. The problem is of course it will p potentially distort the data because you're not watching long strings of bad behaviour, you're intervening and correcting it. But after all that's what we're meant to be doing so we can live with the fact that you might all look better than you really are. But I think that it's important switch in that you shouldn't just be auditing, you should be educating as well. What about excessive hand hygiene auditing? Now, uh, you, you'd be surprised to hear me talking about this, but here is a graph, actually the different states, and you can see in the blue, so we hear a lot of people saying, oh look, we spend too much time auditing. Okay, you know, you require too much of us. Well, actually, some states, particularly New South Wales, have got some good reasons. Some of the hospitals who do this, they have a system that they want to keep going with, which is fine. But you can see that this is the, uh, the blue line is how many uh, moments Hand Hygiene Australia expects of them, and the red line is what they actually submit. So if you've got a system where you really want it embedded in your wards and you're doing this auditing and educating and that's what you want to do, that's fine. But we don't require, like if it's becoming a burden, you, you can probably um, adjust it a bit. And here are some of the figures. So this, there's some pretty big numbers. So actually, sorry, there's some pretty big numbers here, particularly, you know, there are a couple of sites in New South Wales, five hospitals put in about 10% of the Australian data. We're very grateful for it. And as long as they've got EFT to cover it, that's great. But we just worry that they could be doing other, in fact, IPC interventions other than that. And so, you know, it's a question of what your manpower is, it, is like in your hospital. What about the low uh, use of mobile data entry? And I think this is a really key thing. For those of you who aren't using the mobile app, you really, really should start thinking about it. So here's just a graph that Karen presented, but if you just look at the percentages at the bottom, on the right hand side, this is the last audit period, you can see second from the bottom, Victoria um, and, uh, well, Northern Territory, you know, lead the way, about only, even in Victoria, only about a third of the moments are in, entered on an iPad, okay? The rest are being done on paper, then translated on, into a computer. Now it's, on, in some states, like New South Wales, it's only two, less than 2%. So if you're spending a lot of time doing this, you could be saving a hell of a lot of time by using an iPad or, or your iPhone, just by the side, bit of side interest, when we started, in our hospital started using iPhones, our hand hygiene rate went down by about 7% because everyone thought they were texting their boyfriends or girlfriends and not auditing. But so the Hawthorne effect we think is about 7%. Anyway, um, but you know to give you an example, 
the savings, just for New South Wales as an example, I'm not having a go at New South Wales because I think we could, the whole country could improve. And of course these are percentages. Northern Territory is doing well, 66%, but they've only got a small number of hospitals. New South Wales have got the same number of hospitals as Queensland, Victoria and South Australia combined. So it's a big state, right? But just as an example, you know, there are 165,000 moments entered manually. And if you can put in 200 moments an hour, which is hard work, that's 828 hours of data entry, which is 103 shifts, 103 days of activity. So there's some savings here. Okay. Now, on the other hand, Victoria, the, the government gave out iPads, and Jen Bradford's here, she led the program, gave out iPads to every hospital in the whole state. And with that, we found the median uh, time saved was about 30 minutes per 100 moments and that the projected savings across the state was about 97 days of full-time auditor activity. Okay, Reduction in data entry, improved options for immediate feedback because you can just go and take the iPad, plug it into the monitor and show the, that shift, what they've been doing, uh, improved access to educational materials. But then you'd say, well, if it's so great, why is it that only one third are still doing it? We're missing something here. I think some of it is people are technophobic, some people, you know, they, they, although they were taught initially, they don't like doing it. There are lots of issues, but this is a research topic for us because despite being given, in some hospitals got three free iPads with a Telstra card, with everything loaded, and, and yet only a third of them are still using it. So there are some issues here, but they could be saving time. And finally, who, who are entering the data? And you can see some states like New South Wales are doing better than others. So nationally, about 50% is being ordered, entered by auditors. I mean, your expensive orders are expensive secretaries, relatively, or over-educated secretaries, if you like. Um, so again, if you're using an electronic mobile data entry, all of this would just be done as you're auditing. So you should think about it. And if enough of you are interested or think it's worthwhile, we would look at putting in a grant to get everyone an iPad with a Telstra card so you didn't have to argue with your IT department. Do what we did for Victoria. But before we do that, we're going to have to, as we are now having to do, answer to the politicians, well, we spent a quarter of a million dollars on Victoria's iPads and two thirds of you aren't using it. Why aren't you using it? Why'd you let the battery go flat? Must be Dad's fault. <laughs> okay, and finally, uh, future initiatives. So uh, we'll hear a bit more about this later today. So hand hygiene and emergency departments, syst uh, the systemic issues nationally, and pretty soon, if you've got it, or, uh, in the next uh, couple of audit periods actually, if you've got an emergency department, you will have to include data from there. And I can tell you now, prepare yourself because the rates won't look pretty, okay? In my hospital last year, starting hand hygiene compliance in Austin's ED was 21%. Huge amount of effort, it's now at 58%. We take that, we've just under 80% now. If we take ED out, we pass. Keep them in, we fail. Home of Hand Hygiene Australia, it's ugly, right? I have to see the CEO in a couple of days' time. Hand Hygiene and Anesthesia, we've got a new working group. And of course, a big problem with anaesthesia, apart from the attitudes sometimes, but most of them are you know, interested in improving. But there are definitional issues. What's the patient's zone? You know, it's a different environment, it's tricky, um, but there's a way forward. And finally, I would argue, having sat next to my son, who was six some years ago, I know that the hand hygiene rate at the Austin's not 82% or whatever we thought it was. In the middle of the night, it's nowhere close to it on Saturdays and Sundays. And really, at some point, we're going to have to bite the bullet and say, well, we're going to require a certain number of moments being submitted 20, you know, from different shifts in the day and, and different days of the week to get a more complete picture. So we've already heard from Benedetta about the core components, and we'll hear more about that, and of course, the new CRE guidelines. So with that, I'll stop, and thanks for your attention.